but I was obtainable, willing, and cheap. I understand why Ellen and Steve said no, since this is, without doubt, one of the most intimidating and difficult jobs available to a comedian. And there were other reasons why I, too, should have politely declined. First of all, there was the event's recent history. Two years before, Stephen Colbert had performed there and, depending on who you talk to, had either died the worst death ever seen by a comic in the history of comedy and death, or had delivered the most fearless piece of political satire this country has ever seen. The year after, in an attempt to avoid any repetition of the controversy, the WHCA had hired the antediluvian Canadian impressionist Rich Little, who most recently achieved fame in the 1970s with his Richard Nixon impersonation to be the after-dinner speaker. Little had definitely bombed, no debate needed, in a buttock-clenchingly awkward manner, his material was too archaic and meek for the bloodthirsty crowd. I also should have said no because it's the granddaddy of all corporate events, a large dinner in a hotel ballroom where everyone who is there secretly hates and wishes misfortune on everyone else. This is not an atmosphere in which comedy usually flourishes, although having lived in Hollywood for fifteen years, I'm used to it. I should have said no because the sound system in the hotel was so awful it was impossible for anyone in the first two rows of tables to understand what was being said, Scottish accent or not. But I didn't say no. I didn't say no because between safety and adventure, I choose adventure. Plus, I thought it would be great crack getting to meet all those muckety-mucks and, truthfully, as a new American, I felt it would be somehow unpatriotic to refuse a chance to make a fool of myself in front of the president, who, after all, had no problem doing exactly that in front of the entire world. It certainly was an impressive and eclectic guest list, with Salman Rushdie, Condoleezza Rice and Christiane Amanpour sharing warm chicken cutlets with Pamela Anderson and the Jonas Brothers as they sat around big circular tables. It was such an unlikely collection of people that it actually felt like a dream. So much so that more than once I checked to see if I was wearing pants, something I often do, just in case. With a past like mine, it's never a bad idea. Before the meal, there had been a little reception backstage for the people who would be seated at the dais and their partners, although the only spouses at the head table would be the comfortably arsed Mrs. Bush and Mrs. Cheney, wife to Dirty Dick. It was a chance for everyone to meet and have a chat before we would go out on stage and sit in a line like that Last Supper painting. Anne Compton, the WHCA committee chairman, took charge and whisked Megan and me around the room, introducing us to the other honoured guests. We met the diminutive and sassy White House press secretary, Dana Perino, who revealed to me that she was married to a Scotsman, and I said, well, that would explain why she was crazy. She laughed. I think she thought I was kidding. We met Richard Wolfe, the clear-thinking MSNBC political commentator and henchman of the mighty Oberman, who, in a brief conversation, assured me that Barack Obama would be the next president of the United States. This still amazes me, because at that point Obama didn't even have the Democratic nomination. We met Jose Andres, the celebrity chef, who seemed to me as if he'd been hanging around the open bar too long and was banging on in a thick Spanish accent about the wonderful world of tapas. We met a few more broadcasters and White House types whose names now escape me, and then all of a sudden we were standing in front of Mr. and Mrs. Cheney and being introduced. I felt a little awkward. I'm always a bit shy around evil people, so Megan took the lead. She has a knack for dealing with difficult men and is very knowledgeable about fine art, having worked for a time as an art dealer in New York. She and Mrs. C. struck up a conversation about Picasso. The Cheneys were the proud owners of a few of his sketches. Where do you hang them? asked Megan. Oh, we don't, replied Mrs. C. They're nudes, and we have grandchildren. We don't want them to see them when they come over. But they're Picassos, protested Megan. But they're nudes, smiled Mrs. Cheney dangerously. I put a hand on Megan's elbow. I didn't want trouble. You don't want to be in the Cheney shit list. Dick himself was surprisingly affable and had a croaky, easy laugh, but I did get the very strong impression that I was in the presence of a Bond villain. All he needed was a pussy to stroke, although not in front of the grandchildren, of course. We made small talk for a while before the Cheneys moved on to the next gladhanders. Once they were gone, I told Megan that Dick Cheney had been ogling her breath.